Thank you very much for uh, inviting me, Larissa, um, and thank you for organizing this whole series of uh, webinars. They've been great. And also, I think uh, thank you as well to Elizabeth because I saw lots of parallels in what we have been doing and in your project and similar issues, challenges, and uh, indeed benefits as well. So today, what I'm going to present is um, about uh, Europeana and our work around user-generated content. For those that already know Europeana, uh, many of you will probably know of Europeana as a website where you can discover uh, European cultural heritage from museums, galleries, libraries and archives. But Europeana is more than just that one website. Europeana is a whole network and uh, ecosystem uh, in, in to achieve the work of uh, having a website. We uh, do a lot of professional and sectoral support to help the cultural sector in its digital transformation and uh, also bring a lot of material online. The idea, the grand mission of Europeana is to transform the world with culture, but in a practical sense we do that by building on Europe's rich cultural heritage and making it easier for people to use, whether for work, for learning or just for fun. So today what I will talk about is uh, how Europeana engages and creates uh, user experiences with a specific reference to how we have user-generated campaigns and projects uh, in the past and currently ongoing, and hopefully inspire some new ideas and uh, potential collaborations. So a lot of what Europeana does works around the concept of, uh, for, for user uh, engagement, works around the concept of seasons and campaigns. The idea behind this is that we get the right content to the right user at the right time. Uh, so our seasons, are thematic campaigns that vary in scope and duration. Some have taken uh, over a year, some have been for one month, some uh, for a couple of months. They're designed to highlight and promote the high quality content that's on Europeana's platforms, uh, both on our platforms, but also highlighting that elsewhere as well, such as in social media or other outlets. Uh, they're designed to engage European citizens um, who are our users of, of Europeana. Uh, whether they are doing that for fun, for learning, or for their research. And cultural heritage institutions all across Europe. And we do that uh, engagement through different storytelling and participatory activities. So before I talk uh, very uh, heavily about uh, the user-generated uh, activities that we've done, I thought it would be interesting to uh, and useful to introduce the editorial formats that we use at Europeana. Um, they are something that we call thematic collections, which I'll come to at the end, uh, online exhibitions, galleries and blogs. And these are important to sort of know because this uh, helps understand where the user generated content finds its home. So our exhibitions, we publish uh, several uh, exhibitions a year uh, on a, a diverse range of topics. Exhibitions online are very similar to what you might know as exhibitions offline. Uh, they look at a topic uh, from a a wide variety of, of perspectives using cultural heritage material from a number of different uh, organizations across Europe. These are often written in with a narrative in mind and often written in collaboration with multiple partners as well. Our galleries are short, um, up to 50 images uh, selected from Europeana on a specific topic. They can come from, and they should, we hope, come from lots of different organizations across Europe showing the commonalities in collections and also maybe differences and nuances uh, in, in, um, in the topic. Our blogs are uh, short, um, uh, shorter uh, word, uh, pardon me, narrative-led uh, event outlets which uh, tell a story about a specific uh, topic. So uh, we have written things, for example, uh, profiles of people, uh, profiles of companies, uh, for example, looking at a specific topic from different aspects uh, around Europe. All of these aspects find um, a home in what we call our thematic collections. As many of you may know of Europeana, it is uh, a website with 58 million records, which is a huge number and probably not enough, uh, too much for any one person to look at at any one time. To help find content and to help surface content that's uh, useful, we have created what are called thematic collections. These are on different topics such as, as you can see here, from archaeology to industrial heritage to 
uh, natural history and photography to help find that content and uh, surface that content, as well as tell the stories through our editorial formats, such as exhibitions, galleries and blogs. In some of these uh, thematic collections, uh, in particular Industrial Heritage, uh, the 1914 to 1918, which is about World War One, and Migration, there is an element which you can see where on the facet side of things, you can show the content that has been contributed by users. That is a way to show the user-generated content that has come in through our various campaigns and uh, other activities. So mostly today I'm going to talk about um, how we have been doing these user-generated campaigns and continue to do so. The idea of these user-generated campaigns is about bringing uh, culture to people and bringing people to culture. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, uh, culture is something that's part of everybody's lives and um, and is, of course, part of everyone's lives because people's histories and people's stories and people's objects are cultural heritage. We uh, have run these uh, campaigns to celebrate everyday experiences, to democratise and to tell the story of particular large pan-European topics, but from lots of different perspectives, from uh, many different cultures and countries across Europe. In all our work, it's a very important part for, uh, for us to work in partnership and collaboration with uh, cultural heritage institutions as well as other organisations as well. An important part of this is that not every story is recorded already in um, museums, galleries, libraries and archives collections. So this is a way of, of collecting contemporary or indeed stories of the past which have maybe not been recorded or adding more and newer information about those stories that we already know about. So there's a number of different ways that we uh, work with user-generated content. I'm going to give you a quick uh, overview of a few of those, but mainly focus on what uh, we call collection days. So we do some things uh, which are creative challenges. Our uh, annual competition, If It Up, runs in October every year. It's a collaboration uh, with, of Europeana with uh, DPLA, which is the Digital Public Library of America, Digital NZ, which is in New Zealand, Trove in Australia, and Giphy, which is a, a large platform for uh, animated GIFs online. The idea of this is that we uh, have on Europeana and all of these platforms, cultural heritage, which is openly licensed, and we invite creators and to remix that and turn that into a GIF. So you can see, for example, uh, the example here, uh, which uh, in its original state was not animated, and someone has, has done that. We receive uh, nearly 200 entries every year, and it's a really creative and um, really exciting way to see culture being remixed in that way. Uh, we also have a site called Transcribathon, where handwritten um, stories, letters, uh, and, and other uh, handwritten items uh, can be transcribed and uh, annotated. Uh, this is aimed at individuals who do that, uh, or teachers in or different groups. Uh, we often do this in uh, sort of events and challenges on Transcribathon. It's a, a concept called a run where um, a specific topic is chosen and then people compete in, in friendly, hopefully, competition to, uh, to uh, transcribe the most. There are a number of other uh, projects uh, running uh, around Europeana in our, in our var very large ecosystem to help um, annotate and classify culture uh, and the cultural heritage that exists already. So this is an example called Crowd Heritage, which is currently in a beta form, where uh, a number of different campaigns are happening, inviting users to add tags and classify the material they're seeing. So one example is uh, a, a large number of catwalk photography um, and classifying what color is used in those in the clothing that's in on the catwalk. But mostly I think what I will focus on today is uh, collection days and the collection days that we have um, been running for uh, nearly 10 years now. At a collection day, we invite people to come to a uh, museum, gallery, library or archive or other cultural heritage institution to share their stories and objects on a specific topic. Uh, this is very much a collaboration with those uh, museums, galleries, libraries and archives. Um, and it's a very, uh, for them, hopefully a very good way to engage their community and maybe introduce digital uh, ways of thinking to their collections and to their audiences. 
So the topics uh, on which we have uh, done this so far are on World War I, which is uh, simultaneously called 1914 to 1918, on 1989 and around the fall of the Iron Curtain, on migration and on working lives and industrial heritage. And I'll talk about each one of these in turn. When I describe these, I will be giving a very brief overview. There is probably a lot more I could say on these. So this is a, a kind of a quick introduction to each of these topics. Uh, here you can see also uh, some examples of uh, images from collection days of people coming, sharing their stories. Uh, in some cases, collection days are also accompanied by walking tours, for example, or by uh, performances, musical or, or dance performances, sometimes by lectures or, or panel discussions. And they're a very nice way to engage audiences and then also encourage them to share their stories. So our original uh, user-generated um, campaign was uh, Europeana 1914 to 1918. We've been running this since uh, 2011, uh, and this is around the First World War. The idea of this was to bring together uh, cultural heritage institutional content uh, on the topic of the First World War, but also feature user-generated content together in the same, um, in the same collection. So now uh, it has become a resource uh, with material from 24 different countries in 15 different languages. Um, and it's a unique combination of personal stories as well as public documents and, uh, and objects and audiovisual material. Since 2011, we have uh, run more than 200 collection days on this World War I topic uh, in 24 different countries. Uh, collecting and digitizing more than 200,000 uh, digital items. Um, people have been sharing their stories at, at uh, all of these events, uh, not necessarily their own personal stories, of course, uh, but uh, in some cases that, but mostly stories relating to their families or their ancestors. So people have, um, have shared many uh, objects, whether medals or um, uh, or photographs, letters and other artefacts that relate and tell the story of the First World War from lots of different perspectives. Some of these uh, items uh, have found homes in, for example, uh, exhibitions, galleries and blogs. Um, in um, this exhibition that uh, is highlighted here is called Visions of War. It was uh, using openly licensed content and telling the story of how artists and soldiers depicted World War I using material that was collected during the collection days uh, in, the, in the campaign. So moving on from uh, World War I, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, Europeana 1989. This was to commemorate the fall of the Iron Curtain in 2013 and 2014, around the uh, 25th anniversary of, of that. We held events across Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, with 11 different partner organizations and invited people to share their stories and objects of that time and their experiences of, uh, of what happened in their families and in their personal lives uh, at that time. So they shared many everyday uh, objects, uh, such as, for example, this uh, map on the right, which uh, a, a young child uh, drew at one point to show how he uh, wanted Europe to be. Uh, to ev everyday items like the clothing that they were wearing at the time, drawings, uh, money, and other many, many different, uh, a variety of different objects uh, that, that tell of people's experiences of that time. I'll quickly talk also about uh, an, uh, many of these activities, uh, which I'm now summarizing in a very quick way, uh, have multiple elements to it. So there was an element of, of the 1989 project, which was called Freedom Express, where we brought a number of students around uh, to different places in Central and Eastern Europe on a sort of roadshow, a road, roadshow road trip, um, inviting them to reflect and think about uh, the, the experiences that had happened uh, 25 years before. As many of you will know, this year is a 30 year anniversary of Fall of the Iron Curtain. And this year we've uh, built on the, uh, the previous project by inviting people to take part in what's known as a blog parade. Um, a blog parade is where we invite people to write about or photograph, share their ideas on their own blogs and profiles um, on the topic of uh, remembering 1989. Um, so you can look, uh, you, if you search Remember 1989 and Europeana on 
uh, online, you'll find um, a link to a blog which will explain uh, that and show the examples that people have already um, uh, contributed. To move on to the next uh, uh, topic, European migration has been running since uh, 2018. Uh, in Europeana Migration, we created a thematic collection on Europeana, bringing together content uh, on the topic of migration to, from and within Europe. That includes uh, material from cultural heritage organizations as well as user-generated content. So Europeana Migration uh, invited people to share their or their family's stories relating to migration to, from and within Europe. It was, uh, compared to, for example, um, 1418, it was much more contemporary topic uh, because people shared their own individual stories as well as uh, stories from the past. Uh, since last year, there have been 21 events in uh, 12 different countries and more than 600 stories uh, have been shared uh, and we've digitized more than 1,200 different us. So this uh, map shows uh, some of the uh, events where they took place. So from uh, the west of Ireland, uh, Limerick, to uh, Riga in Latvia, to uh, from Wales to Ath Athens uh, in Greece. It was a very mixed uh, number of places. And um, each event was, uh, people at each event, people shared their stories. And many there are many similarities, but of course, many differences in the stories as well. In addition to uh, to inviting people to share their stories, uh, we also wrote and uh, told the story of migration in, in many different ways. So we wrote more than 60 blogs and galleries, not just Europeana uh, as an organization, but also working with a number of different um, uh, partners uh, to highlight the shared stories and add historical and cultural context. An example of that is this online exhibition called People on the Move, which has uh, highlights how migration has uh, contributed to culture and changed the world. These are some examples of the objects that were shared uh, from everyday objects such as jewellery and clothing to, um, to letters and postcards written uh, back home again to keepsakes and memories of home that people bring with them when they move to a new place or new country. Um, these, uh, we also made sure that we tried to photograph some of the people who were sharing their stories because in many ways seeing their faces makes, uh, makes the story so much more real. So these are uh, some examples of people who shared their stories uh, in, in, in one of the events across Europe. It's also worth saying that we also created um, a way that people could share their stories online, not just at uh, events. Um, and actually, the, it's the same functionality, and I'll explain a bit more about that a bit later. Last year, during this campaign, we uh, made sure that we understood the impact of that by surveying people who were taking part, people who were sharing their stories themselves, as well as the organizations who were organizing or um, holding events. So what we found was by sharing their stories, by talking about uh, their identities and their histories, that people had um, a more positive view of their identity. They found it easier to express themselves and said that their levels of self-esteem were higher and had uh, higher levels of self-confidence as well. And these are some examples of um, some of the reasons that people uh, spoke about why they wanted to share their story, what they got from sharing their story. So this first person, um, and uh, to be uh, clear for privacy purposes, the people in the photograph are the people who uh, have said these words, uh, that they are very happy and proud that their migration story was published. They, this person was moved reading reading it, and a good, it was a good step forward for them to be able to... Uh, work on their acceptance of who they are as a migrant. Another person said that when they shared their story, they thought about what had happened in the past. When they were told the story, and in this case, it was a story about uh, this person's family uh, from the 70s. That when they were first told that story, uh, this person was young, and now having thought about it with a more mature mind, it made them realize the gravity and importance in their family's culture and their own uh, culture. And there was a very important element of why people decided to share these stories, similar to uh, in, in Elizabeth's uh, project, where people think of heritage as an important thing to, to share, an important thing to record. Um, so one person said that they thought it was important to share a story, as these kind of events that they described are like a witness to history. Uh, the things that are happening in the world now, uh, it's good to record these. 
and there was certainly an element that they saw cultural heritage institutions as playing a very important role in recording these contemporary stories as well as the stories of the past. Moving on from migration, our current uh, season, which is uh, ongoing but uh, close to its conclusion, is uh, called Europe at Work and it is about working life and industrial heritage. So it is a, um, a both an editorial and a participatory season where we are inviting people to share their stories of their working life, both in the past and, uh, and in the present, as well as telling those stories through a variety of editorials on Europeana, uh, as well as features in, um, for example, uh, outlets such as Daily Art. So for this, we have held 11 collection days uh, across Europe, uh, from Ireland to Finland, from Sweden to Portugal. There has been one, in fact, in Sweden, uh, which Larissa was uh, very generously involved with. Uh, it was with the Swedish National Heritage Board and the Museum and Archive of Shivik. Uh, it happened literally just uh, this weekend, gone past. At these events, people have been sharing uh, stories about different industries, in some cases very varied, in some cases very specific. So we held an event in Finland in uh, a small village called Fiskars, which had a, a, a very famous ironworks. And the stories were uh, all about that ironworks and working at that ironworks. But in other cases, it's a, a much more varied, um, uh, a much more varied collection of stories. So these events uh, took place uh, in, in these places. Uh, um, what we really liked this year was actually that the uh, events weren't all in, in large cities, but actually in cities, in towns and small villages. And actually it was a really nice way to bring culture to, um, and to bring Europeana to parts of Europe that we had never been to before. So the stories look at uh, people's histories uh, and people's working lives. Uh, some in very um, unique jobs, such as a, an opera singer, some in very everyday jobs, such as shopkeepers uh, or cafe owners, um, sometimes looking at them actually working. Uh, some are historical, some are contemporary, some are about the buildings uh, and some are about the people. It's, a, again, a very uh, varied uh, set of stories. So far, there's been about 150 uh, stories shared. And for editorial for this, we have um, uh, showcased in, in blogs and galleries, uh, 50 blogs and galleries so far, the, the topic of industrial heritage and working life. We've showcased over a thousand different um, uh, cultural heritage items. And uh, these have been written by Europeana uh, and partners from across Europe from a, a number of different uh, projects and cultural heritage institutions. So I'd like to also now talk a little bit about how to take part in these projects and what the benefits of doing so are. So one of the things that we uh, have done is made sure that when we work with these uh, campaigns and projects that we are doing these in partnership with uh, many different organisations from across Europe. To do so, we have helped to uh, build promotional uh, tools uh, such as uh, postcards and we can help with the... Uh, with doing so. We've also created a, a guide for hosts, which is a step-by-step -step guide to running a collection day. Uh, I think something really important to show is some events can be very large, some events can be quite uh, more intimate and smaller, but actually all collection days, I hope, are for the organizations and for those taking part, something beneficial to be uh, involved in. An important element is that we have created an online um, form which will allow the story to come on to Europeana. If any of you have uh, ever worked on Europeana projects before and, and aggregated content to Europeana, it's not a, uh, it's quite a, a complex thing. It, it involves metadata and infrastructure and networks. What this uh, form does is directly um, map the story uh, to the Europeana data model and then allow that to be published very easily on uh, on Europeana without needing to go through the usual aggregation routes. As you can see on the form, uh, we invite we ask people to share their name and their email address, which aren't published online. Uh, they can choose to be anonymous if they wish, or choose what name they would like the story to be published under if if they wish to not have their own name. And then we invite people to tell the story and um, and share objects. 
the public element is an important part, but actually the working in collaboration with uh, cultural heritage organisations and helping them with their digital transformation is an important element for uh, Europeana. So for the migration campaign, these, uh, these graphs relate to last year's migration campaign. Most of the partners in that established as part of that uh, project established new relationships with other organisations in their, um, in their uh, city or town. Many of them will, well, actually all of them will uh, continue these new partnerships. So they were a way of opening the organizations to other uh, organizations and uh, new partnerships. And those that worked with existing partners uh, agreed that they, the collaboration as part of the migration campaign was a positive uh, collaboration. What we also find is that um, many organizations are uh, trying, many cultural organizations are on a journey of digitization, becoming more digital, uh, whether that's sharing their collections online or in other ways. But it's a, it can be a long journey in a way. And actually these collection days can act as a, a step along that journey. So for example, this quote from the Fiskars Museum is, is talking about that they don't yet have their collections online and they are working on that digitization. And the collection day that they held uh, a, a few months ago will be the first time that they will be able to share some stories from that museum and from, that, uh, from the ironworks online. A similar situation uh, in this quote from the Stiftung Historische Museen in Hamburg, who also held a Europe at Work collection day. Uh, they are also digitizing and uh, in the process of doing that. And the collection days are a step in the visibility and accessibility of, of some of that collection. And it was a motivation as well for their colleagues to, to see how important uh, sharing online and open access can be. But also in, in, in addition to the digitization and transformation, we can see that this is also helping to build audiences and connections uh, for organizations. So this quote from EPIC, the Irish Emigration Museum in Dublin, who have actually held uh, Europe at Work and European Migration Collection Days, uh, shows that they, the collection days for them were a way of transforming how they engaged with the public and provided them with an in impetus and a platform to engage with uh, new Irish communities and allows them, has allowed them to build connections and not just collections. Uh, similarly, but also maybe a little bit more emotionally, the Instituto Cervantes in the Netherlands, who held a collection day last year as part of European immigration, uh, they spoke about how not just simply that it connected them to new communities, but also that the stories are in themselves are, are very, very interesting and, and help memorialize and capture uh, a community. So they held, their event was about the Spanish-speaking community in the Netherlands, and each of the stories had a whole life attached to it, a story of a family and a particular world of memory and remembrance of their migration experience. So it, the event in itself was a very moving and wonderful experience. So I think uh, that is my, the end of my presentation. I would hope that uh, from here you have uh, seen some inspiring ideas and maybe ways that you could work with us on collection days. Uh, next year, our topic that we're going to do over the summer of 2020 is about sport, playing into the idea of the summer of sport, such as the Olympics being in next summer, as well as the men's football uh, UEFA European Championships. We're also open, of course, to collaboration on any of the existing topics, and I look forward to hearing any of your questions.